my name is Joyce Raimondo. I'm the education coordinator at the Polly Krasna House and Study Center in East Hampton, New York. We're located 100 miles east of New York City. And each month we host our virtual um, art cafe inspired by the cafes that Pollock and Krasner and artists of their era used to participate in, going to sometimes bars or cafes to discuss all sorts of art ideas. So today we, first off, um, I'm actually zooming in remotely from the Bahamas. I'm not on the property of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center. And we're very fortunate tonight to have uh, Kelly Olshin with us, who's going to lead our program about how to write an artist statement. And Kelly is also going to present her own art. Uh, Kelly Ocean is based in New York City, and um, she's a visual artist and arts manager whose sculptural paintings invite the viewer to navigate towards an unattainable place. She's also the program officer at the New York Foundation for the Arts, also called NIFA, learning in career advice and training. She helps artists achieve their art career goals. And during this session, Kelly will share her art and advice on how to write an artist statement. And we'll take some time at the end for people to share a little here and there and get some feedback. And I am a very, very grateful that Kelly has agreed to do this um, really on her outside time and just so happens it's coinciding with the opening of her art exhibit. So I can't wait to, for you to see um, also her amazing art. So let's welcome Kelly. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Joyce. Um, I'm really honored to be here as really anyone in the visual arts or the arts more generally lauds uh, all the organizations affiliated with Pollock Krasner. So it's quite an honor. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Um, as Joyce said, I'm going to talk a bit about my work, about navigating the landscapes of artist statements, whether you're someone who is continue, like continuously working on and iterating your own artist statement. I know I always am. Before I get started, I would love to just get a sense of who is in the virtual room. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple quick questions. You can either raise your hand or put it in the chat if this is you. Um, I'm curious how many people here tonight are practicing artists. Give me a, a raised hand or you can use the Zoom function to raise your hand. Okay. A few of you. Okay, great. Maybe about half the people in the room. Um, how many of you, thank you. How many of you are working in the arts but not as a practicing artist? You're a cultural worker, you're an arts manager. Okay, just me, it looks like. Um, and then anyone who is neither of those things and you're just here because you appreciate the arts and you're curious as to what we have to say. Couple of you. Okay, great. So it seems like most of us are practicing artists, which is great because uh, this workshop is really geared towards supporting your artistic practice. Um, so I am going to get started and share my screen. Perfect. Okay, here we go. Um, so as Joy said, we are going to talk about what I'm calling navigating the landscape of artist statements. And I gave her this title because it is certainly something to navigate, to work through. Um, and also for me personally, there's kind of a thread between the landscape of art making um, and that my work is very much about landscapes as well as the landscape of navigating all things professional practices in the arts. Um, so just so you have a sense of who I am, a little bit more about uh -huh. my background. Uh, as Joyce said, I'm both a visual artist and an arts administrator. So by that, I mean that in addition to my studio practice, I am working at cultural organizations to support other artists, honestly, is really my raison d'etre. Um, I'm currently a program officer at New York Foundation for the Arts, or NIFA for short. I'm in the learning department, and what that is is essentially professional development for artists. So um, anything that has to do with helping artists 
navigate the art world or understand, you know, certain skills or networks or communities that they might need um, to make their goals or their dreams and the arts come true. That's my area. Um, so that can be anything from teaching workshops on artist statements to doing multi-day programs, building artist communities. So I feel really fortunate to do that. I'm I feel that my work as an artist informs the cultural work and vice versa. And that, you know, we're talking about artist statements today. And I think that there's a certain understanding that one brings when they have also wrestled with artist statements. I have written and rewritten my artist statement. And, you know, I know how difficult it can be to be an artist, how fabulous, but also how difficult. And so I really come to cultural work with that lens. Um, my educational background, I have a BFA in painting from UNC Asheville, um, and then I went in, on to graduate school to study in arts administration at Columbia, which brought me to New York. Um, prior to NIFA, I worked as a program manager at a local arts council in Queens, and I've given artist talks or just general workshops like this at a variety of organizations, whether that's RISD or SVA. And I think what I love about this and professional development of artists more generally is this field can feel really, oh my gosh, like how do you get from point A to point B? There's a million and one ways to do everything. Um, and so what I like about professional development is it can kind of help guide us through the crazy world of the arts and give us some like tactile tools that we can help to meet our goals, which is ultimately the goal. So I hope I can be helpful on that front. Um, throughout the workshop, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna do questions at the end, but this is a small group. So if you have questions for me, if something I say doesn't make sense, um, I am totally fine for you to interrupt me. Um, but you can also just uh, put it in the chat and I have the chat open and I'll uh, address it in real time. I see some fans of Anifa Learning and a couple of our fabulous program constituents in the audience. So there you go. All right, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, tonight, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my work um, in part to give you just like a framework for understanding artist statements. Of course, I'm excited to share my work with you as an individual artist, but and, and through the context of artist statement, the idea is, okay, let's start with actual concrete work um, and then build out an example about how you might write about it because I think so much of what can be challenging about artist statements is it's visual. And if we talk in general terms, it can be harder to understand. So I'm going to talk about my work. We're going to segue to artist statements in like 20 minutes. We'll get to that pretty quickly. And we're going to cover tips and tricks sourced from me and the whole NIFA team. Some examples, like think the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then I have some exercises that you could try on your own, and we'll try one tonight together. Uh, then finally, Q&A. Um, so let's talk about my work for a little bit. I'd like to share a bit about my work. The staircase excerpt in the background is my work. Um, so this is a piece that um, I like to start with because it was really the beginning of my current body of work. So this is some earlier work um, that I was making in school. And it has kind of the core elements that show up in my visual vocabulary or imagined world that I'm creating. And that is um, staircases and imagined architecture. I often utilize staircases, which you can see on the right here in my practice. And I think about them as a metaphor for climbing, for striving, for trying to get to the next space that we idealize to be better. Um, yet they're always dysfunctional um, or unclear impossible to navigate. So in this staircase, you know, it defies spatial logic, this kind of spiraling in on itself. It's leading to this blue space or this imagined world, but it's not clear what that actually is. <laughs> um, so I often utilize, you know, these really abstracted window references. Um, and the color blue is really essential to my work too. And that um, when you look at any place that is far away or unattainable, it is often, it is cloaked in blue. It's just the way that light scatters. Um, and yet when you close the distance between where you are and where you're lo looking that's far away or metaphorically where you are and where you wanna be, um, the next space or future space, a better space, once you close that gap, it's no longer blue. 
and it's no longer unattainable. And so the only way to really make it tangible for me is to paint it. So it's about this like process of like grappling with perpetually delaying gratification or being stuck mentally in this better elsewhere that never arrives. Um, you'll see that the, this is 3D. Um, elements will proceed and recede into space. Uh, it's just a trend in my work as well. Um, so this is another more recent piece in a similar vein, you know, still imagine stairscape, stair, stairscapes, excuse me. Um, and here it's like, okay, I'm going to take out some of the 3D elements and really try to master the painting component and build illusionistic windows within windows or paintings within paintings. And similar to the earlier piece, I often will um, kind of take a section of a painting and imagine, okay, what would happen if you look to the left or to the right or up or down in this imagined space and kind of build out um, paintings within paintings through these extension pieces that you see. And this is on panel, it's just really thick. Um, so in keeping with staircases and architectures, I've also built sculptural staircases. This is um, a very heavy, large 75 pound sculpture that hangs on the wall. Um, and uh, it's hung just above the height in which someone could climb it. So it's, it's titled Try. Um, sorry, this title's wrong, but it's titled Try. It's almost like a daring someone to attempt to climb it. And this is the other side of it. And this texture is actually paint that's repurposed from a palette. Um, and again, like I'm really interested in process and material. And so I actually, as part of my practice, scrape up the paint from my palette and repurpose it, as well as utilize other people's artistic waste, I call it. And it's sort of like the visual evidence of process and of working and striving towards something. Um, so moving on to some more recent work, I'm going to start to go quicker here. Um, so here's an install shot with both these pieces together at a recent solo show. Um, and another 3D piece, um, again, finding, you know, paintings within paintings. And um, I designed these in SketchUp. It's like a 3D modeling software. And um, you can see on the right that it has the step that is proceeding and seating. And I titled this vertigo and envisioning, you know, things kind of abruptly falling off or this, this sense of like, if you're climbing a staircase, um, it gets more and more intimidating <laughs> the higher you get or the sense that you've come so far and you might fall off or like the anxiety of navigating a world that defies spatial logic. Okay, so this is a triptych, again, 3D, um, uh, ideating, you know, a paintings within paintings, this sort of receding space. Um, and in this piece, um, what's happening actually from a process perspective is the work is, um, let's see the central composition is actually more or less iterated once, twice, and again, three times by rotating the imagery 90 degrees. Um, and so it's kind of like, almost like you're swirling through a sky space as I envision it. You know, a lot of my color palette references skyscapes, waterscapes. Um, but, you know, the staircase is becoming more abstracted, receding into space um, and a little bit less clear how you would navigate it. And also just thinking about repurposing imagery, like the way that I know that I get kind of stuck renumerating a thought where you imagine something and you imagine it again and then you iterate it. This is called perseverations about that process of like thinking and rethinking and, you know, a little bit obsessing um, about, okay, what would be different if this one thing was changed or one thing was iterated 90 degrees. It's like a way of creating interconnected images. So some more details here so you get a sense of the edge and the painting. Okay, so from here, and I often source images of my own work to inform the next one. So you'll notice that this composition is um, navigated into this next piece. And in my latest work, and we're kind of caught up to recent now, um, I'm really interested in 
creating work that takes over a space. Um, so moving away from hello, I'm a rectilinear painting and into installation world. So um, this is actually painted on the wall, but I figured out with some research how to make something look like it's on the wall without actually painting on the wall. Um, but instead of just iterating or like rendering architecture, thinking of the architecture that's already there as part of the work and getting more into a site responsive territory. Um, so here's a side image of that. You can see the depth here um, and here. And this has been the trend in my recent work. So this is another more installation-like piece where it's kind of bring, coming down onto the floor um, or extending in a non-rectilinear way, you know, the imagery like coming out like this portal receding behind the piece and then popping back up again, um, which is what was happening in my earlier work, but now it's more shaped and less rectilinear. Um, seeing some questions uh, that we are going to get to momentarily that are very good. So hold that thought. Um, some more details here of the painterliness. A um, couple more images. So this is the larger piece on the left and then a section to the right, uh, the detail. And this is what my studio looks like now. So thinking of everything as kind of one interconnected installation, um, build out these uh, cut staircases that are directly responding to the architectural space. Just in my studio, you can see I've cut imagery to exactly suit the proportions of the room and things are finally like descending and moving forward into your physical space. So that's what's happening in the studio. Um, to the detail here. Um, and from here, now that you have like a sense of what my work looks like and just like a foundation example, I'm gonna segue into artist statements, um, how I've thought about writing my artist statement, how you can write, think about writing yours. So thank you for letting me share my work with you. All right, artist statements. So overall, we're going to, thank you, nice, spots in the chat. Um, we are going to talk about um, the difference between an artist statement and bio. I see that as a good question from Isabella that comes up a lot. We're going to talk about some do's and don'ts to inform your artist statement. Like everything in the arts, there's no one right answer. There's a lot of right answers, but there's still some things we can kind of recommend you avoid. Um, strategies for actually writing the thing, right? It's easy to say you should do this and that, but like, how do you do that? It's something I really want to cover, like to give you some tools to write. Um, and then, you know, why it's even important. Um, so let's talk about artist statement versus bio. This is for you, Isabella. So an artist statement is something that discusses your work. And then the artist bio is more about your career. So let's break that down. So an artist statement is gonna cover the formal elements of your work, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like, um, any conceptual underpinnings, what you're thinking about, um, anything that is more of you know, a metaphor or if you have a research-based practice, you know, the, the stuff that goes beyond the formal but is more about the why. Um, and any visual influences, if that's something that visual influences, you know, for me, I talked about the importance of colors and, um, you know, what, why I'm choosing the colors I am, but it could also be influences from culture or art history or just about anything. Um, you should include the most distilled version of this I can give you. This is actually, um, from a, a colleague of mine said this very well. Um, so it's basically just what, why, and how, what you're making, why you're making it, and how process, most simplified version. Um, we'll unpack it, but that's really, that's really all. Like if you can hit those three things, then you're in good shape. Okay, so an artist bio differs um, because um, the artist bio, in my opinion, is a lot easier to write um, because it's really just facts. Um, so you can just share the things that are more you know, objective to your life or your career. So it could include where you're born, any notable achievements in the arts to date. Um, so you could think of it like a narrative resume. Um, it's not one size fits all, um, but any of the following would make sense. So it could be your education, 
any awards, grants, fellowships, scholarships, residencies, if you're in a public collection, if you've gotten any commissions, any notable exhibitions, relevant job, other notable art career achievement, et cetera. Um, so that's really it in a nutshell. Um, I'll pause there and, and see if there's any questions on the artist statement versus bio. Feel free to unmute yourself or type it in the chat, whichever you prefer. I have a question. Um, this is Joyce. Yeah. Um, how much, let's say your bio, like you, you wrote books or you, like myself, you're a museum educator or many artists wear different professional hats within the, within the arts. Uh, do you, for your art, your art bio, how much of that do you put in or do you just stick with your visual resume? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for me, for example, I have kind of two concurrent and separate hats. I'm both an arts administrator and an artist. So I actually have two different bios, one that's artist focus and one that's arts admin. I also have one that's combined um, and it just depends on the opportunity or the thing that I'm applying for. Like if I'm applying for a residency, art residency, they don't really wanna hear a lot about my arts admin work. But for something like this off this workshop, both might be relevant. Um, so Joyce, I would say for you, maybe it makes sense to have one that's dedicated to your cultural work and art or to have something combined or both. And you just kind of use whatever makes sense for that opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. And to address the good question that Isabella just put in the chat about first versus third person. So first person is things like, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, truth, versus, you know, Kelly Olshan, where she grew up. Um, it's a good question. Um, I would generally say artist statements are good in the first person, because you're talking about yourself. And then an artist bio is, is typically in third person. Um, sometimes if you're applying for an opportunity, they'll be specific about what you want, they want. But overall, that would be my recommendation. Okay. Any other burning questions on this before I move on? Okay. All right. So what should an artist statement involve? I'm going to get at the how long it should be here. So um, this is actually one of those instances where less is more. If you can write your artist statement in less than 100 words, that's fabulous. Um, and the reason why less is more is that often the people that are reading it have read a lot of them. They're a little bit um, like in a panel setting, you know, they're tired, they're cultural workers like me that have already been working 10 hours that day. Um, and I think in general with writing, like if you can say everything you need to say in less words, that's actually a great thing. So I would recommend um, you have a less than 100 word version and then about a 250 word version. And that's just because the powers that be, your residencies, your fellowships, et cetera, will typically ask for that. Um, and you want to give readers a sense of what you're making and why. So that's really the, the point here. Um, you can think of it as covering the who, what, when, where, why, but ultimately you're contextualizing your work. Um, and the last point I really want to make here is that this is a living document. So this is related to the question Joyce asked, right? That I, I would love to tell you that you write this once and you're done, um, but the reality is that this is something that you're going to return to when your work changes, when you're applying for a particular opportunity and you want your work to make sense with the statement that you're proposing. And so it's kind of like applying for a job where you often end up editing it and tweaking it for each opportunity or as things evolve. Um, and some opportunities will ask for 100 words versus 250. Um, and, and here, you know, it gets back to like the why we are doing this. We're doing this as a tool to articulate our work, um, to achieve all the things that we want to do in the art. So I know it's sort of cannot, sometimes it can be frustrating um, or feel like, you know, something where you'd rather be making art. But I think the way, the reason we're even here talking about it is because it does have, if you can really cogently and um, 
if you can do a great job at talking about your work, then that will serve you well in terms of opportunities, in terms of connecting with people that might be interested in your work or could support you. So next up, do's and don'ts. So the, these are all compiled um, by, it's myself, but it's also the entire NIFA staff worked on this. Um, and collectively we read, oh my gosh, hundreds of artist statements and applications a year. Um, so you can rest assured that this is sort of vetted and it's, it's my opinion, but it's also a lot of other people's opinions. Um, all right, so let's talk about five do's. So do number one, Provide a vision of what your work looks like. So I'm assuming because this is Paul Krasner that most of you are visual artists, but it could also be a sounds like, feels like. Like you wanna, I, I love to read an artist statement and then have a vision, a sense of what the work is. And conversely, when I read an artist statement and I'm like, I have no idea what this looks like, I'm less than happy. And I think part of the reason here is that if you're applying to something, often the artist statement is the first thing that people read. Depends on how the grant is organized or the opportunity, but regardless of the order, you want it to work really well and in concert with your work samples, which I'll talk about later. So if you describe something and then it doesn't it sets an expectation that doesn't align with the work samples, something something's off and I would go back. Um, and yeah, so I, I mentioned this, it helps fit with the work. Um, you're going to notice I go through these, that I have little exercises at the beginning. I'm going to talk at the end, I'm going to talk about those exercises later. So ignore them for now. Um, and they will make sense. But in the, in the, uh, in the ex instance that you return to this and you're like, ah, I don't know how to do this. These are exercises recommended to help you do it. All right. Do number two. Speak to what you make, why you make it, and how. So the what is the description. Um, the why, I think, is harder because it requires reflection, requires like, oh my gosh, why do I make art every week or every day? Um, but it's super important. And then how is giving people an insight into your process? And personally, I end up, for, I typically forget about the how because it feels like intuitive or not interesting to me. But people who are not as close to it find it really interesting and helpful in understanding the work. Use direct, concise language. So I think one of the many myths of the art world is that we think that in order to validate ourselves as artists, that we have to um, sound like we're getting an art history PhD, or at least try to sound smart or sound valuable, because often as artists, we get the message that we're not valuable. But this really, I would not recommend that. <laughs> I think that, um, and this is a consensus among people at NIFA and everyone I've talked to that like, if you remember that the goal of the statement is to help people understand your work, you don't wanna, you wanna do everything you can to not obscure that understanding. Um, and so in that sense, simplicity is better, um, which is not to say to dumb it down. I really think that if you have a specific term or influence that is really important to your work that people might not know, that's fine. Just feel, just um, explain the term because you never know who's reading it. And just because someone's on a panel doesn't mean that they're an expert in this particular thing or have even heard about it. Um, and so no one's going to know your work as well as you do. And so if you use anything specific, just make sure to contextualize it. Um, yeah. And the last one, like it should be engaging yet understandable to a general audience. And this is sort of the reason I said before about not knowing who's in like an arts opportunity, but also, you know, everyone I imagine here wants regular people, regular people, they want non-arts people as well to appreciate their work on to make sales. And, um, you know, usually that's just what's going to best serve you. Okay. Do number four, include relevant information as it makes sense for your practice. So we talked about this a bit earlier. This is things like influences, things about your process, why you're making this work now. Um, and to be clear, you don't have to do all of these. This is kind of like a word bank of potentials and it's up to you to figure out what makes sense for your work. Um, but another good question that our comms director actually came up with is, is there a life obsession or idea that drives you? Is there a connection to disciplines outside of art? 
um, or any personal experiences that inform the work. And that part is key because you don't want to fully go on and tell your life story if it's not relevant to the work. Like personally, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, but that's not really relevant to my work. So that's bio territory, not artist statement territory. Okay, we talked about keeping it short. Um, really, honestly, people that are reading it are often really tired from reading a lot of stuff. And so being under word count is actually a great thing if you can do it. Um, and people just appreciate when you can say what you want to say in fewer words. Um, and just like real top jurors are often you know, they're sometimes they're doing it on a volunteer basis or they already have a full-time job or there's thousands of applications. And even if they're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, it's just great to have a concise, clear statement that you don't have to spend too much mental energy unpacking. All right, now pet peeves, my personal favorite. Um, avoid generalizations. So this is a personal pet peeve of mine. So, um, if a sentence or a phrase can apply to any or most artists, take it out. So, and this is, both of these things are true to my work. I want to transport viewers with my work and I aim to bring beauty into the world, but that's not specific to me. Like I would imagine that just about most artists aim to bring beauty into the world. So I would be better served by getting something more specific um, to me. Similarly, avoiding cliches. Um, <laughs> example of this, and I've got people have sometimes been confused by this, but like, there are just certain things that we've read a lot. Like one of them is kind of starting with something like, ever since I was four, I remember sitting at the kitchen table, making paintings. And that's true for me, but a lot of people fell in love just about all of us that make our, fell in love with our discipline at some point. And so your time will just be better spent saying something specific to your work. Now, if you have a childhood experience or life experience, that's really relevant to your particular work and you make that case, that's a different story. But we're just talking about avoiding like generalizations and cliches. <laughs> um, this is kind of a different version of show don't tell. Um, but imagine things like I have a uniquely strong approach to color. Like anything that you can't really back up. Like when I read that, I'm kind of like, ah, no, you don't. <laughs> um, but but just the sense that like you don't want to tell them how great you are. You just want to describe in an inspiring and visceral way what you are doing. And you'd be better served talking about in this example, like your approach to color and its intentions and how you're making these decisions. And um, rather than just kind of point blank, generally saying, Oh, I'm great at this. <laughs> All right. Number four, be disingenuous. So I think this comes up, especially in the grant world, but there are definitely trends in the art world or society at large. And, you know, so sometimes you'll see artists trying to retrofit an idea that they perceive as trendy uh, or fundable, um, when in reality, it doesn't really make sense for their work and their practice. Reviewers see through that and, you know, I just recommend being true to who you are and what you're making and why. All right, last one, don't confuse an artist statement with a bio, which we already covered and you guys will never do. Um, but it's a really common mistake um, and just something that, yeah, it's easy enough to, to avoid, um, but people confuse them a lot. Okay, um, I'm going to pause here for a second and just ask if there's any questions about these so far before we dive into examples. Okay, going once, going twice. All right. Let's talk about examples. So I amuse myself by calling this the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, but really the spirit here is like, it's so easy to talk about this in general, but there's something really, I think, helpful about seeing some actual examples. So um, if you all can humor me, I feel like I've been talking for a long time. So I'm gonna ask um, for a couple of volunteers to read a couple of examples I've compiled out loud. I'm gonna start with a not so great one um, that I made up. I wrote it about my own work, but as an example of something perhaps less than fabulous. So can I get a volunteer to read this out loud? 
Awesome. Elizabeth, take it away. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. A not so great example. Ever since I was three years old, I fell in love with painting. I grew up in Alabama by a river which influenced my work. My aim is for my images to transport the viewer and beautify spaces. With a uniquely distinct approach to color, I frequently utilize blues. In addition, staircases serve as a metaphor for ambition, a nod to neo-modern stellated polyhedra. Excellent, thank you. Wow. All right, so <laughs> go ahead, what? No, I just love it. Stellated polyhedra. Yeah, what is that? I had, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so so I want to open this up. What is not working here? Anyone? Anyone can grow up by a river or by a sludge thing. Well, sorry, just a river. You don't say why it influences you. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's something that could make sense if it was explained why it's there. But as of right now, you're just like, okay, I don't know what to do with this information. Great. Anyone else? As confusing, like a confusing terms that make people think, oh, what does that and that and that and that? It's not clear. Totally. It kind of jumps from one thing to another, right? Like you introduce this idea that you fell in love with painting and then you're on to where you grew up and then it's the aim. Like it's a lot of kind of like just moving on without explaining. Great. Other thoughts? You, you claim to have a uniquely distinct approach to color without actually just saying what what your approach is ding 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh images to transport the viewer yeah blah, blah. yeah it's like you and everyone else yep anyone else take one more uh spelling mistakes maybe yep mm -hmm. there's a typo <laughs> which is by Instead of my work, it's by work. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, that's minor, but personally, like, it's when I'm reading these things, sometimes it's a litmus test to be like, did this person do their due diligence? I would say it's different if, um, you know, a lot of panels are recognizing that, you know, not everyone's first language is English. And so I think that's a different story. But if it's something where it's just felt like they didn't put the time in, that's something that people will notice. But it seems nowadays that one can do spell check, you know, Google. So to me, it just shows care. It's like, does someone polish their shoes if they're going to an interview? It just shows de care, care to details. Totally. Um, the last one I snuck in here is like, I would guess that most people would not know. I wouldn't know what neo-modern stellated polyhedra is. Like that's just something that it's like going right over my head. So that's like a jargon example. Okay. All right, let's move on. Um, I'm going to share my actual artist statement with you. Not because my statement is the end all be all, but just in the spirit of showing something that has worked a little bit. Um, and now that you've seen my work, you'll um, see the relationship. So Kelly generously volunteered another Kelly. Kelly, could I ask you to read this? Oh, sure. I am another Kelly. Uh, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Kelly's artist statement. Kelly O'Shan's work responds to the idealism and anxiety of endless striving, grappling with a relentless fixation on a better elsewhere. Her 3D paintings and site responsive installations invite the viewer to navigate towards an imagined landscape. Abstracted staircases defy spatial logic, rendered impossible to climb. They provide false pathways to an inaccessible place, disjointed but interconnected. These structures weave through imagined skyscapes, waterscapes and distance horizons that never arrive. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I want to open up the floor to you for thoughts on this, and they do not all have to be positive. I will take constructive criticism always, as I said, I'm always writing and rewriting this. But um, yeah, thoughts on the statement. What's working? What's not working potentially? I was feeling the pressure of reading it uh, to do you some, because it was yours, I felt the pressure that I wasn't taking it properly in, <laughs> but it's very good because when you sorry to 
uh, jump in. When you were explaining earlier in the webinar, um, that's what you were conveying. I think you did a better job of it when you were verbalising it um, with, with expansion, but that does concisely, clearly define what you described, which is what you were aiming for. So uh, just feedback. Thank you. It's, it's really, really it's, it's very um, concise. It's like each word um, is thought out and it's dense, but I think that's probably when artist statement is to be because you're trying to create a lot. And I think what also particularly you're, what you're working with is not a simple idea. So um, yeah, it's it's like a real nugget to, to chew on and to grasp. Thank you. Isabella? Yeah, I, I really can feel uh, what motivates your work uh, in terms of the first sentence. And then I, so I can feel it, what motivates it. And then I also can see it based on the way you're describing what the work looks like. So I'm traveling um, through these landscapes and pathways. It's quite visual the way it's written. Hmm. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's definitely a goal that I had in wanting someone to visualize the work. When we talk about strategies for doing that. But I also just want to acknowledge here that I did not get this on my own. I had a much longer, more complicated one. Um, and I had someone, multiple people that I trust, iterate it, help me cut it down. And so, you know, for, for all of, for anyone here, that's, completely a tool it's so much easier to do this for someone else than to do it for yourself um which I'll talk about later as like a potential exercise but um definitely getting another pair of eyes or someone else telling you um can help you create this um I also I appreciate the note about it being a little dense I think you're right like I think you know I could imagine a world where maybe one of the sentences is a little bit simpler just to give the reader a break um there's no one right way to do this. Um, okay, so I just wanted to map this a little bit to kind of break it down. Um, I love color coding things. Um, so as we talked about earlier, one way to think about the artist statement is you're just saying like the what, why, and how. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter the order, but you know, if I were to break this down, the why is in that first sentence. Um, the what comes a couple places in terms of like just describing it. Um, and then the how here, you know, abstracted staircases defy spatial logic, they're rendered impossible to climb, um, and so on. So just one way of thinking about it. All right, I want to show you another example. This is actually someone who helped me write my artist statement. <laughs> um, I want to give her a shout out. She's also a NYFA fellow um, and is currently at McDowell. So this is someone who's like, clearly it's working for her. So I wanted to share. Um, can I get a volunteer to read this one? Go ahead, Isabella. All right. Brigitta Varadi is a multimedia artist who delves into tradition, craft, and the everyday rituals of working life. She investigates themes of sustainability and cultural heritage through a combination of research, material experimentation, and community engagements interweaving notions of fine art and craft, labor and heritage, Varadi connects us to the importance of tradition in an era of mass production and global economies. Excellent, thank you. Um, so just in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep moving and just show you again, like in this example, the what is really earlier, right? It's she's delving into tradition, craft, and the everyday rituals of working life. How, through a combination of research, material experimentation, and community engagements, why she wants to connect us to the importance of tradition in an era of mass production and global economies. So, um, yeah, it's working, I think. Um, I also wanted to make the point like, if you're thinking about how maybe this one feels like a little bit more general perhaps in the sense that like it doesn't I think maybe in contrast to mine 
it maybe references like formal, literal things a little bit less. And so what I wanted to point out is another thing that one can do and that she has done is that she has this general artist statement, but then she has another one that's more specific to a body of work. Um, and the benefit of that being the work on the right is a solo show of hers. And so this artist statement kind of works for general applications, but then if she wanted to write a solo show or sorry, um, create a solo show and write a statement about that, um, or, you know, for many of us, we have the broader practice, but we might have particular um, bodies of work that have its own, you know, identity. Um, that's something that one can do. So um, last one, I promise we can get one more volunteer to read this kind of project specific statement of hers. I'll read it. I don't mind. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Brigitte Varadi's project specific. Markings. The project gathers together and explores the different marks used by farmers to identify their sheep in the northwest of Ireland. Each painting pays tribute to the farmer whose wool it comprises. Painted dot motifs replicate symbols from each farmer's unique sheep marking vocabulary. At a time when traditional methods of farming are in decline, the artworks can become vessels repositories of knowledge and memory. The large hand felted raw wool canvases painted using animal branding paints. The project includes photographic documentation, video installation, and excerpts from discussions with Benedict Gallagher sheep farmer and an interactive sculptural work. Great, thank you. Um, so just to, to keep moving, I'm just going to highlight, you know, some things I think are working here. It's that you get a really concrete sense of what the work looks like. You get a sense of her process and making it and that she's engaging with farmers and in a specific community. Um, you have a sense of the why and that it's about, you know, identity and representation and, you know, preserving traditional methods of agriculture and farming. Um, so it's, yeah, I think this is a really nice example of, um, you know, more specific body of work. And I think this could work as a general artist statement too, if, if everything that she made was uh, fell under this category. So just different, different approaches to chew on. All right. So um, yeah, this is just the quick, you know, here's the why, here's the what, the how, another way to break it down. Um, so to move on here, um, I want to talk about a few suggested writing exercises, and then I'm going to have you all try one. Um, so I have four all together to share with you. Um, and these can be things that can help you do the stuff that we're talking about. So first one is something that my teacher and mentor and undergrad recommended, and I find it really helpful. So as a technique to get that really rich sensory language that describes what your work actually looks like, I would recommend taking a piece or a two that you feel really embodies what you're doing. Um, it can be an image or it can be in person. If you can do it in person, great, but whichever. Um, sit in front of it and just write. It doesn't have to be a perfect 100 words, but just write it about it, describe it, use some really rich sensory active language. So active meaning you're you're not using is, but you're using really strong verbs. Um, and that can kind of help you get out of the theoretical and into the like, this is what my work is. Um, Two is really utilizing your, like a network or a friend. Um, it's so much easier to edit than to write. And other people can sometimes tell you like, like in my case, when Brigitte read my artist statement, she was like, you talk enough about staircases. You can do it in one sentence, calm down. And that was, really, she didn't say calm down, but it was really helpful for me to hear of like, oh, okay, I don't need all this other stuff. Um, they can tell you what makes sense. They could even you know, you could even go out for coffee or sit together virtually and ask each other clarifying questions. Like if someone says something and you're like, oh, that's really interesting. Say more about that. Or this part doesn't make sense. And you're taking notes as the other one talks. And then you kind of have a bullet point in the artist statement. Lastly, or sorry, second to last, um, I have found in talking with a lot of artists one-on-one -on -one that sometimes it's easier to talk than to write. Um, and so 
in that sense, you know, I'll read something and then I'll ask the artist questions and then they'll say it verbally and it's great. Or it's like so much clearer than the version that they wrote down. So you could do this with a friend or you could do it just by yourself where you're just talking conversationally or the way you would speak if you were just chatting about your work with a friend or at an opening and record yourself or write it down. And that could be actually a surprisingly nice way to generate what you really want people to know about the work. Um, anyway, if you find yourself getting kind of intimidated or caught up in the writing process. Okay, last one. This is um, something that I personally have done and found helpful. I think this is a good technique if you feel like you're stuck in this ethereal place and you're like, need to kind of bring it back down to earth. And so this is like a simple graph or chart where it's like you're pairing an artistic decision you're making, which we all have, and then you're matching it to a rationale, a purpose, a why. So if it were me filling this out, I'm making decisions to render impossible staircases. Why they serve as a metaphor for endless striving. Um, Brigitte talked about gathering together, exploring different marks used by farmers to identify sheep, right? That's an artistic decision or research, something she's doing as part of her practice. The purpose and rationale as she wrote about being, she wants to pay tribute to the farmer whose wool um, it comprises. Um, and then, yeah, last one, this is me again, you know, utilizing color schemes that reflect water. Um, actually, that's my artistic decision, but I made up a rationale, which was and still appreciation for disappearing marine life. So just a few different uh, examples. Um, so next, I'm gonna ask you all to try it out. Um, we won't, you know, won't make you write your whole art statement on, on the spot. Um, but what I'm gonna ask you to do for just about five minutes or so, if you're up for it, is um, if you have a work of your own, um, documented, I'd recommend you pull up an image of it. Um, and I'm going to give you some time to just look at it and write. And so this is that exercise number one, um, where I'd recommend you find something that you think like is a really good representation of your work. Um, and just describe it, write about it in as sensory and active way as you can, by which I mean you're describing what's happening in the work. Um, maybe you're talking about artistic decisions, but it's all very much rooted in like what the piece looks, feels, sounds like, etc. Um, questions on this, is this clear? Can you tell me yes, if that sounds good? Yikes. <laughs> yes. I have a question. Um, do you want us to just focus on that one specific piece of work without thinking about like the whole body of what we're doing in the statement? That's what I'd recommend just for this exercise. Um, it's just to pick one work that you feel like really represents what you're doing and, and focus there because it's, so to be clear, this isn't going to be your final artist statement, but this is just a way of kind of honing in and getting specific on one piece for now um, to, to help you write about your work. Make sense? How are we doing? Is, are, is anyone else feeling like Elizabeth? Or are you feeling like, yikes? Yikes. Elizabeth, talk me through. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, no, I'll okay. jump in. I'm just always terrified of words. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Um, to be clear, you know, the stakes are low. You could just write it for yourself if that's all you want to do. Um, but I think this exercise is meant to really ground it in a specific image. So even if you're just describing in simple terms what's happening, I think it's a good place to start. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you all about five minutes. So let's go until 7.30. Um, does that sound good, Joyce? I think that okay. sounds great. Okay, great. So I'm gonna let you all write independently for five minutes. Maybe I'll put up some background music and uh, then we'll circle back to 7.30.
Kelly, can I just add, sorry, overshare, um, for those people that feel a bit gripped, uh, I'm a writer and I too get terrified by words. And uh, for those that are struggling, like I would in front of a blank canvas and a paintbrush, um, if they write even five key important, the most important things they want to convey in just five words and then use those five minutes to expand around them and build it out, they'll end up with something they didn't realise they had in them, just to share that. That's great. Thank you. So again, you just said choose five words that what I want to convey. Well, go it. by what Kelly's saying, but I'm just suggesting that if you feel lost, yeah. just start with the most simplest of one word to whatever you're comfortable with. Uh -huh. And it will grow within you from there. You'll feel it come out. Yeah, no, I liked what you said. I just kind of slipped out of Cheers. my ears. Thank you. All right. Okay, let's take one more minute, come to a stopping point.
All right, let's reconvene. So there is absolutely zero pressure, but if anyone would like to share um, what they came up with, we'd love to hear it. Um, it could also just be a phrase or a sentence. As we saw earlier, artist statements are do not need to be long. So if you have like a great phrase or a great sentence, that's not nothing. That's something that you can build upon and um, utilize as kind of your inciting nugget as our uh, writer friends just recommended. So um, any any volunteers, anyone want to share or even just talk about how that was? Either one is great. I can, but others are welcome to. Why don't you kick us off? You'll inspire others. Well, thank you and apologize in advance because um, I just focused on the piece itself and sort of expressing that. I'm not sure, I might be off the mark, um, but I, I went on to say that, um, that I did the, the piece in question, uh, which doesn't have a name, I'll, I'll work on that, uh, as, as therapy. Uh, it was an experimental process. Uh, I wanted to uh, feel what I had grown on the farm, that I had seeded an acacia, that I had watched it grow and flower, and it had brought joy, but I wanted to capture that. And so with a chlorophyll fill process, a sun painting, if you will, uh, I bleached to remove and develop a negative image to capture its beauty with the sun, uh, to feel it, to press it, to subvert its image to canvas was strangely satisfying. The sun-kissed canvas boldened in deep navy left behind the lighter shade showing the detailed beauty of the acacia. There is zero right. apology necessary. That was great. Oh, <laughs> That's thank exactly, you. exactly what we were envisioning, um, or I was envisioning. Um, so that was that was fabulous. Um, I thank you. Let's hear from other people. Like anything that you took away from from that short statement. This is Joyce. I'm wondering if it might be better if you change the order to first describe the work and then talk about the motivation. It might make it a little more concrete. Just a thought. Thank you. What do you think, Kelly? Yeah, I think um, I think for this exercise, it's more like we're developing something to draw upon. We're not necessarily like, oh, this is the finished statement, right? If we could write that in a minute, that would be, you know, unrealistically great. Um, but I think it's great source material you can pull from and then start to think about the order to Joyce's point. Um, I really, I pulled out some phrases that I thought were really effective, um, particularly around, you did a really good job contextualizing your process and giving people a sense of how it's made, which is something that's really helpful in general, but especially for your work, like the fact that it's a chlorophyll process, that it's bleached, it's removed, it's developed some great strong verbs, sun-kissed canvas, you know, I have a sense of how you're making it and what it looks like. Um, I liked, you know, using seated as a verb, seated in acacia. Um, so I think that's, uh, yeah, some strong language that you can certainly pull into your artist statement. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah. Any other volunteers? Okay, I'll be a fool. Um, so, Gone Fishing, a sculpture in the series When When, based on the historical Elizabethan dress, is made of repurposed plastics. The work aims, I'm oh, sorry, plastic and plastic microfibers, ubiquitous in our environment, will last longer than humans and will create a new history. Uh, this work aims to address the excessive use of plastic. Anyway, that's all I wrote. <laughs> That's great. That's, I'm impressed. that's great. I'm impressed you guys did this in five minutes. Um, yeah, I feel like you especially got to the why in that last sentence as well. Really? Okay. Yeah. Could you read it again? Do you mind just that last sentence? Yeah. Uh, well, I, so, sorry. Um, the work aims, sorry, plastic and plastic microfibers ubiquitous in our environment will last longer than humans and will create a new history. 
this work at James, it aims to address the excessive use of plastic. Great. Yeah, I think that last sentence is the why. Wonderful. And then the sentence before that okay. gave a nice picture of the work. I have a sense of what it what it is, what it looks like, what it feels like. Great. All right, thank you. Okay, I see a couple other people have raised their hand. Feel free to jump in because I can't quite see who has their hand raised. Um, well, I'll go if the other person won't. Um, family members from both sides of the United States racial divide caused by the transatlantic slave trade engage in one-on-one -on -one conversations upon revelation of their shared history. While neurological devices measure the impact of their emotional experiences and translate their brain waves into sound. Mm, beautiful. Wow. That's good. It's about five minutes. Yes. Well, I guess I don't know how long have we been going um, with questions and, and responses because I've been taking this whole time to write that. So. Fair enough. Um, beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Because you have a sense of, in a way, it's like you're describing what's happening in a literal sense, but it is clearly articulates how it's rooted in history, why it's important, why you're making it. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I wasn't expecting <laughs> positive feedback on that. Thank you well, so come much. On. Um, let's do one more. Whoever else had their hand raised. Going once, going twice. All right. Um, well, thank you for doing that um, and for sharing it. I was really struck with um, how much progress, how much you did in five minutes. Um, that was great. I hope it was helpful. Um, and again, that was one exercise of a few. So if that didn't work for you, then there's some other options that you can try out. Um, and I believe this will be recorded so you can access this after. All right. Um, I put together a silly little review um, just for fun to wrap up before we do questions. So um, I have a series of three questions for you. So in review, question one, and you can put your answers in the chat. What is the difference between an artist statement and bio? Other answers, put them in the chat. Okay, Kelly thinks it's C. All right, the answer is, drum roll please. Oh, whoops. C, um, an artist statement focuses on, on your art while a bio shares objective information about your career. So people in the chat got this. Like the bio, as Nicholas said, is more about education, accomplishments, so your career, and the artist statement about your work. Okay, question two. What is the purpose of an artist statement? A, <laughs> to sound smart. B, to earn a PhD in art history. C, to contextualize your work. Or D, to culture creatives. <laughs> All right, you guys got it. C, to contextualize your work, of course. And also sometimes D, but that's not the purpose. All right, um, last question. Which of the following could belong in an artist statement? A, influences, visual or from art history. B, context on your process. C, why you're making the work. Or D, all of the above. Ding, ding, ding. All of the above. All right, great. You guys aced it. So with that, um, before we do questions, I just want to say if you want to stay in touch with me, you can find me on the interwebs, on Instagram here, my website. Uh, I even gave you my personal email <laughs> and phone number. Um, or if you have um, NIFA related questions, you can shoot me an email at that NIFA address. And uh, Joyce will share this after and I'll drop it in the chat momentarily too. 
Um, so with that, Kelly, before you take it, questions, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us where your current exhibition is? People might want to see it if they're in New York. Oh, sure. and how long it's running too, please. Thanks, Joyce. Yeah, I currently have a piece up at The Yard in Williamsburg, which is a co-working space. Um, it's curated by a local curator called Anti-Curatorial, but um, it's at 195 Broadway, which I'll put in the chat. It's an exhibition called Hybridity, and it's open through May 6th, I believe. Oh, excellent. All right. So while I am putting my contact information in the chat for anyone who just can't sleep tonight without it, <laughs> I'm sure no one, um, I would love to hear your questions. Um, thoughts, comments, things you're struggling with. Let's hear it. I really appreciate those examples. I always think that seeing the horse makes you see the horse. So thank you for sharing those and you're really articulate in laying down. Also having that what, why here gives a directive. So appreciate that. Great. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm glad you said that. I, debated a little bit between and giving an example because there's no one right way to do it. So I don't want to put it on a pedestal of like, this is how you should write an artist statement, but there is something to mystifying of just seeing it done in different ways um, to be like, oh, okay, I can do this myself. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, Kelly, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, Something I have a challenge with uh, is I work with glass uh, in in a, a newer way. It really didn't start till like the early eighties, uh, painting with glass using fusing and, and uh, flame working with a torch. So I, I think sometimes I'm getting um, a little too technical. And I think um, uh, I'm wondering two things, if I'm, applying for something to a glass school like Corning, uh, am I just using the technical terms and assuming who's reading it knows them? Um, and if I'm describing in an artist statement for non-glass, um, how to handle it? Because it's still really kind of new what is emerging with this kind of work. Yeah, um, all great questions. I think one way that you could work through this from a writing perspective is one of the exercises I recommended, which is just simply pair writing. Um, so sit down with someone who, in your case, maybe someone who's familiar with visual arts, but not glass work specifically, and talk them through it. And maybe you'll use a technical term and that person will say, well, what is that? What does that mean? And then maybe you'll have to explain it in terms that make sense to someone who's interested in the arts, but doesn't know glass. And that could be a way of like getting at that language. Um, I also think that it always comes down to why it's important because you could, I'm sure, school me and most of us about the technical components of glass and love to see your work, by the way. Um, but maybe it doesn't need to go on the artist statement. So this goes to the why it's, if it's really important that we understand a particular aspect of the glass making technique, because maybe it's rooted in a history or I don't know, it could be a million reasons, but it's really important that the viewer gets it. It's figuring out why and that why going into the statement, as opposed to just kind of educating people about glass for the sake of it. There's a time and the place for that if you ever want to teach glass, you know, um, but it might not need to be in the artist statement. Thank you very much. Sure. Other questions? Nothing. I covered it all. <laughs> I doubt that. I'll ask one. Yeah. I'll ask a question. Okay. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much for doing this. It's awesome. Um, so when I first saw your, th th this is actually more about photographing your art in terms of your statement. Um, when I first saw your piece, um, 
in the very beginning of the presentation, I was looking at it and it looked like it was a three-dimensional painting. And it I wasn't sure if it was all painted to look 3D or if it was actually 3D. And it wasn't until I saw, I mean, I, I saw your work later when you showed it in the museum in the staircase that I actually got, it was really 3D. And then the last photo that you showed um, was the installation photo and you could see it on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, when you're applying to art calls and art to, to, to get your out, art out there, you're sending images to, to these people. And I, I do work in, in 3D art. And so, um, at least some of my work. Um, and, and I feel that unless I'm doing an oblique shot or something or showing how it's installed, that people won't get what it is. Um, but then there are instructions for submitting your art and it's don't show any borders. And, 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 and so you're, and then you're really limited in what you can submit. So I think you, you're trying to address this a little bit in your statement in terms of the, the, the 3D, but is that how you do it? Or do you have any other, because it looks like you're running into the same issue with presenting your art. Um, do you have any other ideas for, for how to represent your work so people can get that type of 3D impression? Yeah. Great question. Documentation struggles are really real, especially for those of us who aren't making, you know, work on canvas or on paper. Um, so yes, in short, I think side shots are your friend for sculptural work. Like for me, having a couple of those, and I've gotten this feedback from curators that you really have to see that side shot to understand that it is really three-dimensional or the way it's receding or proceeding into space. Um, also, install shots are your friends. Um, again, gotten this advice from curators, not just about my work, but just through programs at NYFA where we kept hearing that through work sample reviews because there's something about seeing it in space, getting a sense of scale. And that can particularly help for those of us who make sculptural work or work that might need a little bit more visual information for you to understand how it's operating in space. Um, so I think both of those could be tools for you. And I have heard over and over again from curators that if you're asked to submit 10 images for um, an opportunity, you can include those. Um, sometimes the side shot helps more than the front on shot. Um, and you can definitely include that install. Sometimes it's great to have an install shot at the beginning or even the end so you have a sense of how it's working. And you could draw upon artist friends or even just any second pair of eyes. Sometimes I'm so close to the work, like I know it's 3D and I know what it is. And so it, I think it's clear, but I'll have someone else look at it and they're like, I can't tell this is 3D. I don't know what this is. <laughs> kind of like what you said, right? Um, so I think those three things could perhaps help you. And then also if you really aren't sure, um, not for every opportunity, but you can often email the humans at the other end of it. And it's their job to give you advice. Like you could just say like, you know, do you recommend, you know, are side shots okay? Or how would you, you know, what would you recommend us in bed? And some people will respond to you and, and give you advice. I think there was one, I hope that was helpful. Um, I think there was one more question. This is Nicholas. Maybe less, maybe a question, maybe a question comment. Um, as someone that was, uh, as an accounting major, not a uh, BFA, I often have the experience when I go to like museums and I read the statements that, like, I don't know who they wrote it for. They didn't write it for, for the lay person, I guess, you know, where it just it feels like it's so dense it's so, it's so many words that i'd have to you have the dictionary to uh so i don't maybe i just don't know if there's a way to to you know to kind of test it to see maybe it's just like what you're saying and getting feedback from others but um maybe sometimes when you're um i don't know so i guess a little bit i guess that's more of a comment than a question but um you know just how, how to get a sense of whether or not it's resonating with with others. Yeah, I hear in what your comment slash question that it's like grappling with how 
fine art or excellent art is presented in the world that often doesn't necessarily land in terms of helping us understand it with, you know, museum goers and how, okay, you're kind of asking the question, which is, I think, a good one. Like, how does that reconcile or does it contradict some of the things we talked about today? Um, and to that, a couple thoughts. Um, one is there's a lot of critique of the museum world being elitist and, you know, the curators at large, you know, I, there are a lot of people that would agree with you that, you know, some of the text is really not helpful in understanding the work. Um, but from the more practical side of us as artists who would love to be in museums, um, I think it's two different things in that when you are applying for a grant or a show or what have you, um, I do think the things that I shared Dan, not because I know everything, but just because, you know, I talk to people in the field. Um, and so it's that audience that you're writing for. And then if you are to get to a position where you're fortunate enough to be shown in a museum, it's people whose job it is to write these curatorial statements, whatever you think of. Um, and there's some, there are people that are really have a foundation in art history and it's their job to kind of intellectualize and contextualize it in the larger, larger scope of art history. But it's a, it's a good question. And it's one that, so, you know, people talk about. So worry about that, worry about that when, uh, when they're calling on you to hang your piece in the. Or better yet, don't worry about it let them write it because they're getting paid to do that, it. That's what I meant. Yeah. Let them worry about it. Right. Yep. Thanks. Um, I want to acknowledge that we are a little bit over time. Thank you so much um, for being here, for your thoughtful questions, and um, to the Paulette Krausner House and Study Center and Joyce for hosting. I hope that this was helpful, and thanks for being making time in your Tuesday evening for this. Well, Kelly, I want to give you like the biggest thank you ever, because you have been so generous in your time you know, on your evening time to share this with people. This has been so helpful and so concise and you're obviously an expert at what you do and your artwork is outstanding and so relatable to such a wide audience. You know, the idea of always wanting more or another place, it's so relatable. And for me personally, it also reminds me of the idea of ascension there's a positive aspect to it, right? We're, we're ascending maybe to a higher level, hopefully through uh, sessions like this. And um, I hope people visit Kelly's website. And also you could see a recording of this. It will be posted on my YouTube channel, Joyce Raimondo at YouTube, and also on probably on the Pollock uh, Facebook page. If, you know, And of course, Kelly, I'll get your permission before we do that. And um, I just can't even tell you how grateful I am that you did this. It was very, very generous. So let's give uh, Kelly a big Zoom round of applause. Mm. Woohoo! <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And we have people from all over the world. I see someone from Argentina, Martin. Woo! See our Zoom friends from all over the world. So thanks again, Kelly, and good luck with the show. Bon my pleasure. You all are too kind. Have a great night. Bye. It's truth, Kelly, it's the truth. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce. So much. Thank you, Joyce. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce and Thank Kelly. Thank you, Joyce, too. Bye. Thank you, Kelly. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Joyce. Bye. Bye, Kelly. Thank you.